On September 30th, the spirit of the Children's Society Tri-Cities newest minister held an event called National Day for Truth and Reconciliation and Teaching Powell, Healing Through Understanding at Queen's Park, New Westminster City. Tri-Cities Community Television prepared this coverage for you. you guys know about resiliency and resiliency to me is being able to pick yourself up no matter what kind of walk of life you're walking is picking yourself up and learning from where, where where you were and a long time ago I was given a story from this from this from this older guy and he told me he says a long time ago out on the prairies when, when we were first let off the reserves in 1951. And he went into the, he went into the town, but every time you know, he went into the town, he got drunk and he never, and he spent his money, but he didn't have enough money to feed his kids after that. So this one night that he was walking by, he had all the best intentions of, of, of being sober that day and staying sober because it was coming fall time. And when he was walking back, like when he went, when he, first of all, when he went into the city and like got the city into the town, he, he ended up drunk again. But that night that when he was walking back and, the, and on the prairies, it was, it was a nice blue night. It was like, you could see the stars, the Northern lights and the grandmother, grand, grandmother moon. And he was walking home and he was crying and he fell down beside this old oak tree. And he's like, Grandfathers, grandmothers, it was, how am I going to feed my family? How am I going to take care of them? And he fell down beside this old oak tree. And that spirit of that old oak tree said to him, he says, get up, my son. When they come to cut me down, I can't get back up, but you can. And that's our people. We need to do that and face each other and go in a good way. So with that being said, we're gonna move on to our, our our spiritual human being here. His name is Albert Wesley. He's coming on. Give it up for him. Good morning, everybody. Can you all hear me? I just wanted to introduce myself and uh, share a little bit of my history. Uh, my name is Albert Wesley. I, I was born and raised in Prince Rupert, BC. Uh, I come from the Nishka Nation and the Simshan Nation. Um, my, my parents went to residential school. And just to give you a little bit of insight about how I learned, it took me almost a lifetime to realize all the atrocities that they went through. When I was young, I learned of the stories of residential school and I thought that was kind of a good thing. I wanted to go myself and my mom said, no, that's some place you never ever want to go. I thought it was like a boarding school, you know, you wear a uniform and all that stuff, but it was way different than that. So my parents, they, they're gone now. So I'm saying a prayer for them and all the, all the ones that we've lost along the way. Creator, I come to you humbly today giving thanks for this beautiful day, bringing all our people together, all our indigenous families and non-indigenous. Thank you for coming, sharing the day today to learn more about our people's struggles, what we've gone through as, as a community and what we're learning. Hi, Chika. Whoa, my gosh. Thank you so much. Um, they gave me 10 minutes, so I'm going to try and talk as really fast as I possibly can. <laughs> Normally, I take 20 minutes just uh, introducing myself on a daily basis. So, I swail, amir sa pwakwilam, good day, everybody, and welcome. My name is Len Pierre. My ancestral name is Palikuluk, 
and I'm Coast Salish from KT First Nation on my father's side and Musqueam First Nation on my mother's side. I am the owner and CEO of Len Pierre Consulting. We are a tiny but mighty Indigenous consulting firm uh, that specialize in education, training, project management, and all those other wonderful uh, fun tasks that consulting groups get to do uh, all across Turtle Island. Uh, I come to you today with an open heart and an open mind, and I hope to be received in, in the same way. I've been invited here to share with you some words on the theme for today's gathering, which is resiliency and allyship. And I say when I come with an open heart and an open mind, in full transparency, we are still in the truth era of truth and reconciliation. So I have it in my heart to share with you some truths uh, today. But I cannot say I, I, uh, enough that I'm entering this space with an open heart and an open mind, and I do hope to be received in the same way. But first, I want to begin by expressing gratitude and appreciation to uh, Spirit of the Children for inviting me to share some words. I want to raise my hands to all of our elders, our matriarchs, our youth leaders, uh, moms and dads and aunties and uncles who are in the space here. And of course, I raise my hands to each and every one of you. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here today. I know that there are a hundred different places that you could be in at this very moment, but the fact that you have chosen to be here with each and every one of us today is no small thing. This is the essence of reconciliation moving forward. Your presence here matters and your participation here matters. So I raise my hands to each and every one of you from the youngest person who is here to the oldest person who is here. Thank you for being here. When it comes to, hi, Chika, thank you. Yes, thank you. When it comes to reconciliation, I do want to be very transparent because I was watching the news uh, this morning. I watched the news religiously, and the news is very good at portraying reconciliation as learning just about the residential schools. And if there's one thing that you're walking away with today, please let it be this that reconciliation in this country is not just learning about the residential schools. If we make reconciliation just learning about the residential schools, we might forget about Indian hospitals in this country. Indian hospitals that were racially segregated hospitals were also hundreds and countless stories of atrocity, of torture, and of course murder happened in these racially segregated hospitals. If we make reconciliation just learning about the residential schools, we might forget about the starvation experiments on starving Indigenous children in the residential school system that directly informed Canada's food guide, which is used in the kindergarten to grade 12 education system today. If we just make reconciliation about learning about the residential schools, we might forget about the dog sled slaughters that happened with our Inuit relatives in the north where the RCMP would come into their communities and then slaughter every single sled dog that belonged to that family in that community to demobilize that community. So forcing them onto reserves was a lot easier. If we make reconciliation just learning about the residential schools, we might forget about the missing and murdered Indigenous women, girls, and Two-Spirit folks. That is a significant crisis in this country. If we just make reconciliation learning just about the residential schools, we might forget that Indigenous children today do not have access to the Amber Life Alert Saving System. So please, if we could remember that reconciliation is not just learning about the residential schools. With that, in the era of reconciliation, I always like to remind people who show up to work with us that colonialism in Canada was incredibly strategic, incredibly intentional and occurred over a long period of time. So our work in reconciliation needs to be equally strategic, equally intentional, and of course occurring over a long period of time. In the era of truth and reconciliation, we do need great allies, which is why I cannot thank you enough for being here today and wearing your orange shirts and bringing your children and bringing, inviting them to be a part of that learning journey. 
hopefully many of you are holding hands with your children today are journeying together on this very long journey towards reconciliation and justice doing with Indigenous peoples and in seeing this as a lifelong journey. But it's also a lifelong unlearning journey too because there's, there is some things we have picked up in Canada that we learned about Indigenous peoples that is just incorrect. So we might need to retire those uh, uh, at some point. So it's not just a lifelong learning journey, it's also a lifelong unlearning as well. When a cop comes to my top 10 things you need to know about Indigenous allyship, and I don't have time for all 10, but here are some key takeaways I hope you're walking away with for your heart today on the teachings of Indigenous specific allyship. Number one, and I'm just going to be transparent with you, not every Indigenous person out there in Canada today likes the word ally. Some Indigenous peoples prefer the word ambassador or um, accomplice, ally. Ultimately, I do like this word allyship. I do like the word ally because it implies that you're going to have my back. And I sure hope that if I was out there in the world in public, and being met with some racism or discrimination or some intolerance by another member of the public who is a stranger to me. I hope that if you see that happening to me, that you're gonna go, no, 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 not on my watch. And that you will stand up and you will have my back and that you will have, you'll be an ally in, in action. So I like the word ally because it implies that you're gonna be a friend and have somebody's back. Um, another thing that we need to know about allyship is please, please, allyship, a lot of people think that it's about being a good person towards Indigenous peoples, to be kinder to Indigenous people, to be more respectful to Indigenous folks. And I'm like, no, you should already be kind and respectful to your fellow human beings. Allyship really is about change and justice and transformation. So I always say you can only really be an ally in a moment, and that moment has to be rooted in some type of action. When you are taking up reconciliation action, you are a great, great ally. But the moment that act is over, you literally need to cede and surrender your allyship hat. It is also important to know that only Indigenous peoples can deem a non-Indigenous person to be an ally. And I try to use this in, in my conversation. I try to let people know if they had my back. I'm like, thank you for having my back back there. You are a great, great ally. But only Indigenous people can deem a non-Indigenous person to be an ally. And there is this uh, performative allyship that comes up in the era of truth and reconciliation today too, where it is suddenly cool and groovy to be learning about Indigenous peoples and working with Indigenous folks. So we do need to get around this performative allyship too. So I often encourage people, you know, please do not self-proclaim yourself to be an ally because that's kind of like showing up and introducing yourself as a hero. And you don't really show up into spaces and be like, hello, my name is Len and I'm the hero around these here parts. You know, it's kind of really self-performative and really boosting one's own ego. And lastly, I will just end on this note of resiliency, resiliency being a focus of this gathering as well. As Huomoch people of these lands and territories, we are a resilient people. And that resiliency, that strength is embedded in who we are. It's in our songs, it's in our dances, and it's even in our DNA. The people of these lands and territories, the territories that we are gathered on today, have stories about surviving the last ice age and stories about surviving the great flood and stories about enduring a smallpox pandemic that wiped out nearly 90 to 95 percent of our population. Those are surviving apocalypses. And if you run into conspiracy theorists out there who talk about the end of the world or if you have a fear in your heart about the world ending sometime soon, my inside joke is just make friends with an Indigenous person because we are strong and we are resilient. And it's no small thing that we can gather today because we, are not, we don't just have intergenerational traumas, we have intergenerational strength. We also have intergenerational grace because I tell you, it's a graceful thing when elders and knowledge keepers and performers and artists can gather on September 30th and share our culture so freely and willingly with the world today. So we never have to go back in time where Canada tried to erase us from the history books and the textbooks. 
So we are our living body of intergenerational strength, grace, and resilience. Thank you so much for having me. I raise my hands to you. Have a great and wonderful day. Hi, Tsepka Siam. Okay, give it up for Glenn Pierre, everybody. Great words of wisdom from this young man. So with that being said, what he said was, is, it's right. You know, just in the past three weeks, there's been seven indigenous males murdered by the hands of the RCMP. I'm not sitting hating on them, man, but it happens. You know what I mean? But we need to be able to work with each other and walk with each other in a good way. One of them happened in my, by my home community in a, in, in a town by the name of Antaki Coop. And the starlight tour, tours are real. I got the scar, scars on my legs from that. And those starlight tours, if you guys ever heard about them, it happens on the prairies where the city of Saskatoon, the police would take us out back and leave us outside after they get, beat us. And that's part of the truth that we got to talk about so that we can move forward and we can work with each other in a good way. And what Len said is right, work together in partnership and, and understanding and compassion and grace. So with that being said, we're going to move on to our next, next uh, person and, her, and she has a good story. Uh, like a, like a, like she's been through a lot and my hands go up to her and now she's a really big important person in our community and my hands go up to her her name is Annalise so come on up Annalise oh sorry I forgot about that um no no this these, these two um hi I'm right here right now we're going to be talking about families sorry guys this is just um we, we're, we have families I kind of forgot my agenda I made a mistake <laughs> but here we have Kimberly and Jordan. They've uh, been walking across Canada and they're going to come and talk about their truth today. So, oh. Yeah. Hi. Um, my name's Kimberly Joseph. And I'm Jordan Joseph. Um, we have four boys placed in ministry care right now. And we have been battling with MCFD, Ministry of Children and Family Development, to have even visits right now. So as our battle with MCFD was going on, we got tired of hearing no. We were denied in every which way to have a visit and even talk to our children. So we decided to walk. We started our, our walk in Prince Rupert, July 27th, and we have made it to just outside of Cash Creek. And um, we will be continuing down to Parliament by October 11th. And the hard part about that was um, how they took them away. Sorry about that. They warned us. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. It was uh, it was crazy. They they were only supposed to come up to check on a check on a few other families. They came to check up on a few other families, and they didn't uh, explain to our chief and council how they are gonna come see us and and just before that my grand grandfather has just passed so i was taking it pretty hard i was getting angry and um my counselor he took it i guess the wrong way and told me that i was being a uh how can you say an angry person yeah an angry person and Saying that I was drinking, there was no alcohol in the house, there was, and before, he, he was explaining how all those, like, 
holes in the walls that was from prior before from everybody else coming into my house and partying because yeah and they judged me because I was allowing anybody to come to my house to make them feel home told them there's the fridge there's the cupboards you could do whatever you want my door is always open even though if I'm not home so if you're cold or anything you need a place to stay I gave them a home but I was working with the MCFD for a little bit, uh, handing out uh, hampers and stuff. They were saying that I was a really good guy, that I have to, that I have to go out more and help. And that's what I did. And right after that, I met this beautiful, beautiful lady here, and it did start going down hills after that. There were, there. Were, <laughs> it's okay, it's okay. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, so... So it was, it was just hard for me for being a first-time father. Uh, we have four boys, and my youngest is about to be turning off one this October. And we were asking them months prior to be able to make it for their birthdays, to be able to have our traditional stuff with them. But that's not going to happen. They, they told us that we're going to have a meeting on this Tuesday. Yeah, this Tuesday about it. So we're not going to see my, our son's first birthday as a family, we're asking. That really broke me. And for all the for all the people and the stories we heard on the way, especially for the single fellas out there and the fathers that has no support as well. They're they're fighting really hard trying to make it trying to make like a word go out to MCFD saying, yes, not all fathers are bad. Not everybody's bad, but everybody, yeah, needs a helping hand. Everybody needs someone to stand up with them, a community member, uh, uncles, aunties, grandmas, all of them. We all need to stand up together we got to stop this from happening, stop all the stole, stolen children that's still happening today. And my wife, she she uh, been taken before she was turning six, and she aged out of uh, the MCFD. And we both lost our language, we both lost our cultural. So we're trying to walk to raise this awareness that they're, they're not, they're, they're not taking our cultural serious. And we need, and we need to, we need to, right yes, we need to find the right supports to get all this happening. Because all those children out there, there's, they're crying for their family members, for their parents. And we don't know what's happening with them. If they're healthy or not, if they're safe, or if they've been feeding. Because every time when we, we have a conversation with our children, they say they're, they're hungry. And every time when we see them, and that's only twice ever since they, they uh, from when they took them. And every time when we see them, they have clothes on from years before, like a year, year prior before. They're still wearing the same clothes. They're aged out of their clothes, and they still haven't got them anything. They haven't uh, gotten them their health, health um. Yeah, the medical checks. 
or they're dental. They ha and we we scheduled everything before they took them. And our and our son needed a a helmet and um and a ultrasound for his uh, kidney. And that still hasn't happened. So we're really worried about our children that's not being properly taken care of, properly watched. Like, like he said, there's children right next to you. You have to watch them. And this is a scary world. It is a really scary world. Yes. Um, thank you. We all like fun. Um, so what what initially though is that we have four boys that are taken we have done the hoops that they made us jump through we did them and they're still denying us we've heard stories that if you just do what they say just do it and then you will have your children back we've gotten hours back within months it's amazing that you can do that but in our community, in, in our MCFD, it does not work like that. So um, we just wanted to let you know that we have a Facebook page, Walking for All Children in Ministry Care, and a TikTok, Walking for All Children. So thank you. Can thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. So support their walk. You know, and it's, it's a good thing what, the, what they're doing. You know what I mean? So what we're going to be doing and we're going to be talking about next is, is resiliency and being able to do what they need to do to be able to get their kids back in a good way. So with that being said, we're going to move on to uh, our elder who comes to uh, Spirit of the Children. Her name is Vera. And she's going to help her way here right now. So everybody, everybody give it up for Vera. Hey, Albert, can you help, help this young lady up here? Listen, thank you. Oh, 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 oh. Here she goes. Thank you, Vera. All right. Here you go. You need this? Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you. Okay, my name is Vera Jones. I'm Niska. I come from the northern part of uh, Terrace, Northwest Coast, and um, I'm also a survivor of the residential schools, uh, 14 years, five years of age, till I was 19. And uh, I, I never graduated. Um, I, was, I spent all those years just surviving. Uh, to make it through each day, and it hasn't been an easy, an easy journey. Um, I was wondering if my mom and dad were going to come and get me. You know, there was a the first residential school I attended was uh, St. George's School in Lytton, just outside of Lytton, and uh, and I used to go down the field. And I would look across the river, Fraser River, and I would look at the mountains. I learned some songs, and one of the songs I learned was, she'll be coming around the mountain. You know, it's kind of weird. But I, and I would sit there, and I would wish my mom and dad would come around the mountains, you know, and come and take me away. And uh, it was just a fantasy I had that one day they were going to do that. And so nine years in that residential school, um, I was punished a lot. I didn't have to do anything bad uh, to be punished. Um, I was kind of like a punching bag. I was an example to other kids. You know, if you do this, this is what's going to happen. And then they would either bring the ruler out or a leather strap, or, you know, use your hands, and then they would just whack me. Uh, at one point, uh, the staff got me right across the face, uh, both sides, 
and uh, burst, burst my eardrums, and I became very hard of hearing. And so that didn't help my life at all. And so uh, anyways, uh, I was there for nine years. Then the next two years, I was sent to St. Michael's in Alar Bay. And by that time, I was kind of like a teeny bopper, 13 years of age, 14, uh, starting to look at guys. You know, and uh, But I, I had no idea, you know, that was, uh, that was just part of growing up. Um, I thought I was a bad person, and I never learned anything. I didn't learn anything about, you know, uh, child development, um, teenage development, grown-up development, you name it, I didn't learn anything. In fact, uh, when I was in Edmonton, I was there for three years, and uh, uh, I didn't graduate. And I don't say that loosely. Um, because of my hearing, uh, because of a lot of other things um, growing up, uh, it was too painful. Um, I, because I couldn't hear anything, I didn't learn anything. And so it was, uh, it was a terrible time for me. And so uh, I didn't know how to make friends, you know. And, uh, uh, yeah, you know, 132 girls on one side of the on the girls' side of the residential school, and I never developed a friendship with any one of them. And uh, I, it took me a long time to come to that uh, realization, like decades later, that the reason why they didn't want to hang out with me was because if they did, they would get punished. You know, so if you hung out with me, you be careful, you'll get punished. You know, so that's, it took a long time for me to realize that. And so no matter how hard I tried to um, make friends, it wasn't easy. And so I, I've had to let that go. Um, that's just one of the many development that I, I missed out. And so, um, it's been a real struggle uh, to try and make it on my own. Uh, when I was 19, I remember thinking to myself, how am I going to survive out there in the white man's world? Because that's how we saw the world. White man's world, residential school. How am I going to survive in the white man's world? And uh, of course, not talking to anybody. Um, didn't help me at all. And so I, uh, well, well, I got out there, I tasted freedom. And it was uh, um, a freedom that kind of made me go a little bit way out there and uh, I do things that I, a normal person wouldn't do. And uh, I'm embarrassed to say that, to be open about that. But that's just how it was for me. That's all I understood. I didn't understand much of anything, you know. So it hasn't been an easy road for me. So having said all of that, uh, you, you can kind of guess how my life was like, you know, as a survivor of residential schools, the beatings I took. Uh, the isolation that I, I had to create for myself in order to survive and uh, not talking to anybody. I mean, you know, because if anybody talked with me, they would be punished. And, uh, and so it was a very lonely, lonely time for me, uh, not uh, having anybody. And I longed for that. I didn't know that's what I was going through. And so after um, a taste of my freedom and acting out and stuff like that, um, the, I think it was in the early 90s, 1990s, somewhere around there, they started doing the residential school convention uh, conferences. And the first one that I attended was at the Hotel Vancouver on 
Georgia and Burrard. And I wanted to go there. I was so excited because I was working downtown and I wanted to go there. So it was an opportunity for me uh, to meet up with other survivors and find out what this whole issue is about. You know, what are they going to do for us? And what are they going to do for me? And so I, uh, I, I wanted to, I did go, but be damned if they didn't want $150 for me. Where am I going to get that? You know, I was already trying to make do with the income that the government was paying me every two weeks. You know, so uh, so I, I resented having to put out that kind of money I didn't have. You know, so uh, I'm over that now. So um, anyways, I just thought I'd let you know. Um, so it was the start of my healing journey. And uh, to, and I was amazed that it was a Native organization that started this ball rolling, and uh, and that was really a big plus for me. Ever since then, I started attending the um, different uh, meetings, organizations, the Native organizations that would hold circles. Uh, sharing circles and stuff like that, and meeting other survivors of residential schools. And that was really uh, quite uh, a turning point for me, uh, for my life to take a, a, a turn for a better better way of living. You know, so um, I the government beat the crap out of me and all that other good stuff since I was five years old. I hadn't even f developed anything at five years of age, but they did a damn good job of beating that out of me. And then decades later, after being away from the residential school, it was the First Nations organizations that came to me and they said, we'll heal you. We will include you. You will be a part of my circle. and." We will be there to support you every step of the way. And that is exactly what has happened. I, I've sobered up. I'm over 40 years sober now. And uh, thank you so much. And uh, I have a, I was never close with my family. I didn't know anything about family. And, but now today, it's a different story. I, I have, uh, I have children, I have grandchildren, and I have great-grandchildren. And uh, we are a very close-knitted family today. And I wouldn't have done that without the First Nations organizations and their, their reconciliation in action. They are an example of what reconciliation looks like today. And the truth that comes out as painful as it is, it is important to move forward. And that's exactly what I'm doing today. So thank you all for your time and attention. I wish you all a very good day. And uh, I also want to um, acknowledge my creator um, who has been with me every step of the way. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Vera. So we're going to move on with our agenda. We, like I said, like we have a very action-packed, well, not action, but uh, an agenda that's pretty packed. So we're going to be going on to our next speaker. And I kind of introduced her wrong, but now we're going with Annalise. So everybody give it up for Annalise. Well, CM, Anhal Squalor and Quinn's Quachinomi up. I'm happy to see you all today. Uh, thank you for coming out. I'm really happy that we have great weather for this today and nobody's sitting in the rain. Sorry, I'm getting nervous. Uh, there is a teaching. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> There's a teaching I want to share first, and I share it all the time, um, that uh, 
my elder Bucky shared with me. If you have tears today, don't wipe them away. The, the tears are part of our healing process and they help us let go of the pain that we might have still. I've also been taught that the tears might not necessarily be ours to, that we're letting go of. So don't wipe those tears away and let them flow. I moved down here about uh, 11 years ago. Or no, sorry, I moved down here nine years ago. I found out that I was a Squamish member 11 years ago. Um, I joined our Squamish Ocean Canoe family nine years ago, and ever since then, I've been learning about uh, our Squamish teachings, our protocols. I joined our canoe, uh, canoe family, and I've participated in tribal journeys that goes up and down the coast. For me, my resiliency is not giving up on finding my family. I was part of the 60s scoop and I did not know that I was Squamish until 11 years ago. I did not know that I was Kwikwakiwak, um, well, longer than 11 years ago. I think I was about 15 when I found that out. My resiliency is passing what I'm learning down to my son. So many people that are here today did not get to grow up with their culture like my son has been privileged to be able to. I didn't know anything about being Indigenous. I didn't even know about residential schools because they weren't teaching that when I was in elementary school. They were sugarcoating everything. You learned a little bit about the artwork. You learned about totem poles. And that was it. You didn't learn about the horrors that we went through. But the horrors don't make up who we are. This is who we are. We're resilient, we're strong, and we're not going anywhere. My son is seven and a half, and he's been in the canoe since I was nine weeks pregnant with him. He's grown up with this culture his whole entire life. You saw him on the stage with me. He's, he's done openings with us. He's sang songs on his own. He speaks our language when he can. Sometimes he gets shy, so he needs that encouragement. But for me, that's where my resiliency is, is passing it through to him, is learning what I can so that I can teach him, so that he can grow up to be a strong warrior man and teach Every each and every one of you that are here teach you what it means to be indigenous and what it means to be resilient. That's where my resiliency is in, is Kaimana. A lot of people hear the word ancestor and they think 100 years ago, they think 50 years ago, 80 years ago. My mom is an ancestor. My mom would probably only be in her 60s right now. She's an ancestor. This didn't just happen to ancestors from 100 years ago. This happened to ancestors 10 years ago, 5 years ago, 20 years ago. So as an ally, I encourage you to understand that, that this isn't just ancestors from hundreds and hundreds of years ago. These are ancestors recent. So as an ally, understand that, that this is we're still going through this. There's still parents and elders today that, like you've heard, that have gone through these, these horrors and that are surviving. So as an ally, I understand that it's not just people from hundreds of years ago that have passed. They're here today still. Being an ally, don't rely on Indigenous people to, to teach you. You need to learn on your own. You need to attend these events and listen to the elders that speak. You need to do your research online. You need to go to go to the library. If people still go to libraries these days. Um, but learn on your own. Don't put it on us to do the work. It's not our responsibility. There's indigenous people don't have anything to reconcile. Indigenous people are getting out the truth and it's on, it's on you as allies 
to listen to that truth and to do the reconciliation. I just want to thank all of my elders and all of my teachers and my canoe family that have helped me to get to this point where I am. One of them's coming up soon. Um, it's not just all, it's not just elders that you can learn from. You can learn from youth. There's another speaker coming up and I've learned from her too. So I hope that everybody can walk away with a good heart and a good mind and, and have learned something from today and can take that message and pass it along. Cause that's how reconciliation is going to work. Also, you need to, to take what you've witnessed and pass it along. It's, it's a slow process, it can be a slow process, but if you keep telling people, and they keep telling people, and they keep telling people, that's how our word's going to get out. But you need to take the action on what you've listened to. Thank you everyone for being here. I'm happy that you're all here, and I hope you all have a very wonderful day. We'll see you. Good job. Thank you, Annalise. As we talk about today and about a lot of the issues that we face as Indigenous people, always remember that we have to, there's two ways to do, do things. We need to actively listen and listen without responding. Listen to our stories. Listen to the things that we've been through. Like I said, like we've been through a lot. And here's a, here's a young man who's about to come onto the stage and I really like him, he's a good man. He walks his talk and he walks in a good way. I have a lot of respect for him. Let's give it up for Bucky. Just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, sir. A hot squall to know up. To come to me, was click nobody up, paid the tea. Teacher Mayo, to not go to Tomo. To come to Tommy Eamon, to ace quality seats. To come to Tommy, to ail to heart on and to know you up, see him. It to tea not a sock way. It was the chaos. It was a moat up. To come to Tommy, a static snowyer. A stat knuk nail to not la haha anek. The cocoans took that a o so old as comish. To come out to me, it goes a mush chit disqual to sits a scot a stat snowyer, a stat knuk nail eman. To thank the Creator for this beautiful day and thanking each and every one of you wonderful people for helping out the spirit of the children's feelings here today. Not only today, but years past and years to come. I was thanking our first person of our Squamish people roughly about 15,000 years ago was created. His name was Chaconstan. And that name carries on today by our Charlie family. Not too long after, the second, his, his brother came down from the heavens, Schalotin, and he brought down a gift from the Creator, from God. He said, this is what you're going to use to help your people in ceremony in whatever ways you need. 15,000 plus years ago, it hasn't changed today for some of the work that we do on the floor. That is resilience. When we have elders that have been learning ever since and passed down our teachings in the proper way, it keeps us strong. It keeps us alive. And as I call her pumpkin, as Annalisa mentioned, her son Kaimana is learning. So we know that our future is strong. And when you have children, as was mentioned, that's what's going to carry on your teachings. We all have the same, but it's just a little bit different. 1969, recently, a couple of our, our ladies back then, E.L., Vanessa Campbell, 
as Quetzaltenat Val Moody went into our communities of our Squamish. They spent the evening teaching our language and our culture to whomever wanted to join them at the night. In 1972, we had a Catholic church, St. Thomas Aquinas. Their principal and their teachers, the nuns, came down to our chief and council table and they asked, do you want to teach your children your language, your culture in our school? And they said, yes. So since 1972, I started learning our language, who I am is Squamish, our culture. Prior to 1972, myself, my siblings, and our cousins, we played road hockey in front of our house. We played football just a block away from in front of uh, St. Paul's church. We rode our bikes, we raced each other around the block on the foot and on the bikes. That's what I did when I was growing up, prior to age 12. And once again, that's when I started learning our language. And since then, I've been teaching as many as I can to speak and to learn who they are Squamish. But not only Squamish, our people intermarriage with other nations other people. So they come in to live in our communities and we learn their way. We adopt their ways. The medicine wheel, the smudge, all other traditions that each and every one of you carry. And I thank you once again for sitting here because this is why we do it today, is to share who we are as Squamish. Our Uncle Louis Miranda, when I started learning in 1972, he taught us through all the way through high school and probably about 10 years after that. And by then he was in his 90s. And he would catch the bus, maybe five to 10 miles to the next school, along with Vanessa, to teach the children in that, those classes. So we have a lot to thank for our elders, which is now our ancestors. We do it for them because their strength to carry on what their elders, what our ancestors since time beginning 15,000 years ago, to keep them alive. And when we change it just a little bit, that's hurting them. That's hurting us as well. So our namings, our marriages, our funerals, our deaths, any ceremonies that we have, it'll be in front of us here on the floor where the camera is. And we would ask each and every one of you, or the men, to come forward and ask you to take care of what we're gonna share on the floor so you can bring it back to your people when you arrive home. And for allies, I've been teaching in School District 44, working for our nation, for our people. Our students once gain the language and the culture. But I met a lot of great, wonderful people in the school system, no matter who they are and their nationality, their beliefs. Because some of the people were very reaching out to say, who are you, Bucky? And I showed them, this is who I am. This is who we are, Squamish people. Some of the students that we say, quality the non-native people, when they go pick up my students and bring them to the classroom that I was assigned, the teacher would say, Bucky, this little blonde girl, blue eyed, she wants to come into your classroom for the day. And I said, sure, no problem. So she came in and she did very well with the language. The next class, two days, I would have it every second day, and the teacher says, Bucky, this little girl wants to join your class. I said, sure, she can come again today. She said, I'm sorry, she wants to join your class for the rest of the year. And it was probably maybe two months to June. And so I 
told her teacher, I said, she'll have to go and talk to her parents first, get their permission, see how they feel about her coming to our language classes. So the next week, when I went to the pick up my students, she was allowed to come in to the classroom for the rest of the year. And she got an A. So it's just the person, and this little one is the hot on and the good heart, the good mind that we really want to grab, that we want to pass on. Not only who we are as Native people, but who we are and all our beliefs. Because that's who we are here on Mother Earth. And two principles, one in West Van and one in Burnaby. They worked in School District 44, their, their principles for Indigenous learning. And they came and they said, Bucky, we want you to come in to our schools and talk about TRC and once again, show who you are, teach who you are, Squamish. And I said, sure, no problem. And when I came to those classrooms, once again, those children were wanting to learn so much and it made me feel really well. So I'd like to ask each and every one of you to put up your hands like this. Your palms facing your face. Otherwise you're catching a fish this big. <laughs> so our Squamish, our Coast Salish people says, welcome to our home. Also, thank you for coming forward and sharing and listening to what we have to say. So when you reach out, when I share, when I reach out and you share, this place in front of us is never empty again. It comes to an understanding who we are as people. Before I pass it on to her niece, I want to look around and see what you see. If you want to yell out, just yell out what you see. Clouds, the sky, the trees, the grass. Mother Earth, yes. Who created it? God, the creator, created everything that we see. He created us as well. So when you see the beautiful trees, the beautiful sky, the clouds, the grass, that's what you and I see. When I look at you, I see you. And when you look at me, hopefully you see who me, who I am, the Squamish, First Nations, whoever we are. It doesn't matter who, we're all on Mother Earth for the same thing. We have our beliefs. Sure, we have arguments, but when we argue, we come to the better agreement for the betterment of ourselves, of everybody else. I was going to ask a young girl or a young person to come forward at this time. Any young person. Hi, how are you? I am Charlotte. Hi, Lucille. Interior Salish. Okay. Try. Hot squall to know. It's okay. Swat quies na. Chuk quena wano. Ti ancha chow. You see how shy she is? Do you think she understood what I said? No. This is what our children went through when they went to residential school, not understanding English, and that's how they became into the schools. But I'm not gonna pass on what was done because she didn't understand. So I just thank you for bringing Lucille up and have a great day. Thank you, Lucille. Marie. Thank you. All my relations. Oh. Hot squad to know up to Sakhalit, Kwe Kushamin, Mabel Nahaney, Kwiensna. Good day, everybody. My ancestral name is Tasakhalit. My English name is Mabel Nahaney. Um, I don't have too many words to share. 
but I'd like to acknowledge both of my grandparents who are survivors of the residential school. Um, my papa went to St. Mary's Residential School in Mission, and my grandma attended the Indian Day School, which was Oslohan, which is the school that I go to and attend to this day. I'd like to raise my hands to all of you for wearing orange today and realize that we are not honoring only the residential school survivors, but also the 60s scoop survivors and the Indian Day School survivors. What allyship looks to me, what it is to me, is working within my community, working within my school district, teaching it to the next generation, my generation, and the next. And I'm not too fond of the word reconciliation, but I think my sister Annalise described it very well when she said, it is not our job to do the work, it is your job. We, I'm losing. <laughs> I'm nervous, but that's all I have to say. Osium. Osium. Thank you, Bucky, thank you, thank you. Give it up for Bucky and Mabel. So, <laughs> you guys ever just almost remember stuff, but then you forget? So that's why I'm on a schedule here. So hold on one minute. Okay. We're going to be having a grand entry. So I'd like to, this time, but like right before we get started into that, I'd also like to give thanks from, from all the spirit staff for the, the Mayor Burnaby. Can you please stand up? I guess he's not here. Any counselors from Burnaby? Uh, thank you guys. Give it up for them to come out and on their day off and coming out here. And all the other dignitaries that we have from New West. Thank you all. There you go, see he's standing up, but I didn't ask you to stand up though. Hey, I'm just kidding. <laughs> But anyways, with that being said, I, this, this, this is what we need to be able to do is have partnership and work with each other in a good way. And like what Len said was a powerful message, especially when it comes to medical issues and being discriminated against there. We need to bring the truth and light to that. You know, being discriminated... Is, is harsh, makes you feel less than if you let it, but it's hard not to. And I really like what Len had to say today. Let's give it up for Len, you guys. There's a lot of hard work in this community and our community, and our community also, and the way I look at it, is all across Turtle Island, is helping each other. All of us as human beings just help each other, work with each other, so that we can make a big difference. And my hands go up to Annalise, my sons too, and my daughters. They all grew up with this way of life. They don't have to worry about this learning. They grew up with it so they'll know it well. And that's a beautiful thing. It's a gift. So with that being said, we're going to move on to the, our grand entry, and I'm going to bring up all spirit staff and all the committee members. Rob, Jen, Jen, please come up here, please. All spirit staff and community members. The front, Ruth Weller, all of our elders out there that thank you very much for coming out. And the last residential school to close was in my area on a, on a, it was called St. Michael's. 
And that was by Duck Lake, Saskatchewan, Beardy's Oak Mason. I was the last one to close. My cousins, my aunts, my uncles, they all went there. But they got me in day school. And with that being said, like, you know, but that's how we have to be able to do stuff. So like I said, like, raise your children in a good way. Teach them how to be good people. And Albert, Albert, you were, Albert works here too. He can come to the front. Everybody give it up for Albert. <laughs> Where is, is, is that everybody from Spirit of the Children? I don't know. Ruth Weller. And tonight, in the spirit of truth and reconciliation, go to your local bingo hall. See, these are our community members. This is who works with our people. This is what we do. This is how we, we, help, we help bridge the gap. This is how we be able to have events like this. But being able to learn from one another. And I was told that to being able to have to make your, your community real to you, you need to serve it. You need to serve your community. It's just like your relationships that you have with your children, you need to be able to serve your children. You know why? So they don't put you in an old folks home when you get older. Just kidding. A little bit of Indian humor fun. Can I get Chief Rhonda Larrabee to come up? And more spirit staff. Skyus. Daniel. Okay. Yeah. Joseph. Daniel. Daniela. Jonathan. Rose. Juliana. They're busy. They can't come up. With that being said, we're going to honor them. Sorry, guys. Sorry. We're going to honor them in a good way with all the hard work that they do and taking that time. Always remember that time is sacred. We can't get it back. Make it count. Go ahead, Northern Cree. Take it away. Hi, hi. We're a little bit backwards today, but that's okay. Okay, hey! Everybody stand up and honor them. Oh, -ho! Oh, ho! Welcome to Spirit Children! And here comes Josh. Put your hands together. Oh. <laughs> After this, we're going to have a learning powwow. Go we'll stick around. Go get some food.
people with the flags, please go in the front. We're here, we're only gonna dance half, like what, five minutes? Yeah, just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just kidding, but here we go. You want to introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Just kidding. Yeah. Here he is. <laughs> I hear if uh, Cree make, doesn't make funny, they don't like you, so. Uh, oh, right. Uh, Tanshi, bonjour, hello. On your beset, de Shika Shan. Uh, je m'appelle André Bessette. Um, my background is Métis, French, Croatian, and Irish. And uh, I'm here with our jigging group. This is Lyric Suji and Kathleen Nisbet. Uh, Lyric and I have been jigging for eight, eight, nine years. And Kathleen's been fiddling since she's youngin'. Um, and jigging was a big way of uh, how I reconnected with my grandma's Métis heritage. Um, everyone sh uh, shared so many stories about their experience. And, um, you know, mine, my, my grandma was a proud midshift woman, but she didn't talk about it. She didn't share it with her kids, and she didn't care share it with her grandkids. And um, when I sort of found out more, and in my teens, I started to look into our family history. We're connected to Cuthbert Grant Jr., who before Louis Riel fought against the Hudson's Bay Company during the Pemmican Wars. We're connected with a lot of prominent Métis families back in Manitoba. And I thought, why the hell am I not proud of this? Why don't I know about this? Why don't I know more? And, you know, I can't help to think that it wasn't because of the systemic racism in Canada, perpetrated by Canada, that my grandmother didn't want to teach it or didn't want to share exactly what our Métis uh, background was. And so it's taken a lot of journeys. And uh, over the past eight years, I've been jigging. And over the past three years, I've been going back to Manitoba, uh, competing in jigging competitions and not placing because, you know, everyone there jigs as a little kid and <laughs> learns growing up. But I've uh, been reconnecting with family back there. And that's been a hugely important process. And, you know, um, as a Métis person, I'm still uh, a white settler as well and a Métis person, and I'm still on host nation's territory, so I still am an uninvited visitor, and I try to practice uh, uh, understanding um, cultural and host nation's practices as well as learning my own Métis history. And one of the things, talking with my First Nations friends who have lived through intergenerational inter violence of residential schools, and my own journey of reconnecting, you know, for non-Indigenous Canadians, what I ask is for you to actually look into your histories and your backgrounds, because the federal government, you know, enacted these policies. The residential schools were employing nuns and uh, teachers and priests. You know, um, the RCMP were created specifically to practice some of these genocidal practices. And so what I ask everyone and what I've heard my friends ask me to do as well is look into your backgrounds as non-Indigenous Canadians to find out, are you connected to residential schools? Are you connected to some of those RCMP practices, those governmental practices? Because as Annalise said so well, reconciliation is actually for non-Indigenous folks um, to look into your histories and and understand that and try to work through that because that's a complicating thing to go through. So I wanted to share that, um, but we also, I lost my dancer. Oh, there, there they come. Oh, thank you. So we're gonna do two little sets for you. We're gonna do some traditional Métis jigging, uh, which is really low to the ground. Um, we try to keep our feet as low to the ground as possible. Métis people have been called uh, the horse people. So a lot of our steps, Oh, good, and the stage is nice and, and bouncy. So a lot of our steps, uh, uh, traditional steps, revolve around that horse step, right, where you can play the spoons too. And we are going to show you our traditional Red River jig. And uh, this song was first sort of recorded or written down um, in the 1800s, and it's uh, a mixture of uh, Scottish, French, Irish, and... Uh, uh, Cree and Anishinaabe power steps. So without further ado, we'll give you the traditional Red River jig. Oh, right, because it's going to go. Go. Yeah. Thank you. 
Okay, not too bad. We're working on it. <laughs> it's our traditional set. So the uh, Red River Jig was done. One of the stories is told. We used to have a hundred different fancy steps, and all y'all who want to learn, we're gonna teach a couple steps at the end. But uh, yeah, the Red River Jig just out in the competitions, out the performances, it just goes on and on and on forever. People keep going up. They have to change fiddlers because they cramp up from playing it so much. So uh, yeah, next we are gonna uh, perform the sash dance for you, which is another traditional Métis jig. And this comes from our Scottish ancestry. So there's a lot of uh, Scottish Métis. The Cuthbert Grand Jr. that I was talking about earlier, he was half Scottish and half Cree. And so the Scots used to do a sword dance where they put two swords down on top of each other and they dance around them before a battle. And if the dancers stepped on the swords, you know, it would be bad luck for the battle. So we use sashes, not swords. Um, and we, we dance around. It's a community dance. I like to say that we try not to step on the sashes, but it's just a community dance. It's all fun. You can do however, however it works. Um, we're, we're using really long sashes today, so we're, we're adjusting. Um, yeah, and yeah, stay tuned. We're going to get everyone up and jigging a little bit. You can even do chair jigging, uncles and aunties, cookums and mushums. You can just do jigging right from your chair. It's really easy, real nice. All right, so here, I'll, I'll give this back to you. Thank you, thank you. They, they still gonna dance and stuff. Thank you so much, it's awesome to watch. I would just like to just say one announcement. For all of you that are standing up, we have elders behind you that wanna see the Métis Jiggers. Okay, so please be respectful and let them watch. Hey. Oh no, keep tell, tell a joke or change shoes. Yeah, he's changing, he's changing, he's changing shoes. So maybe he'll do a full dance now. Just pulling knees. Yeah, he's, 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 he's a good guy. So these are our Métis clickers. Yeah. 
And they were made by Métis people in Red River. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So they're half moccasin, half running shoe. <laughs> and the Scottish people made half and then the natives cook over the other half. <laughs> Just kidding. No, I think I think that's right. Yeah, score it So these are our clickers. As you can tell, there's just two dancers. Oh, that was a lucky one. Generally, we do uh, eight-person square dance performance. There's square dance uh, companies all across the prairies. There's Vinnie Dancy here, which we also perform for. So usually square dances are broken down in the competitions into two sections, a second change and a breakdown. So Lyric and I have been working on our Red River duet working on making it into a two-person performance. So we're going to have a little square dance for you. And then we're going to show you our Red River duet breakdown. All right? <laughs> I should have brought my... Uh... Huh? It's, uh... that's allowed. Can they come closer in the area? You can bring it all in. Just try to, you know, don't stand in front of the cameras, I guess, you know. Got to be ready for my close-up at all times. If your head is there, it's going to be awkward, right? Okay, <laughs> so the Red River Jig um, has two parts. So the first part is the basic step. So the basic step is really simple. It's three steps. One, two, three, and let's go. One, two, three, scuff. One, two, three, scuff. One, two, three, scuff. One, two, three, scuff. And speed it up, scuff. One, two, three, scuff. One, two, three, scuff. One, two, three, scuff. One, three, scuff. One, two, three, scuff. One, two, three, scuff. One, two, three, scuff. One, two, three, scuff. Right? Okay. So they call jigging Métis cardio, right? So, gotta get that heart rate up. <laughs> so, um, the next part of the jig is called the fancy step. So how the jig works structurally is you have the basic step, then you do a fancy step, 
basic step, fancy step, basic step, fancy step, basic step, fancy step, until you fall asleep on the floor because you dance too hard. Okay? <laughs> so, the first fancy step I'm going to teach you is called the bunny step. It's one of my personal favorites. You just scooch forward and scooch back. Forward and back. Forward and back. And you can put your bunny ears up if you want to. Personally, I like to have one ear because, you know, if I had two, you wouldn't be able to hear me. And that would be weird. Okay, so a couple things about jigging. When we're jigging, we don't want to stomp on Mother Earth super hard. We want to be respectful of her. And another thing is, in, well, traditional dancing, which is what the bunny step is, a traditional step, it's not like, it's sliding on the floor. So you go, yeah. So a story that, Yvonne, who taught me how to jig, she's the own, owner and creative director of Vinnie Dancy, he used to tell me is that we weren't allowed to dance on Sundays. So if you look through a window and saw somebody um, and they were jigging, for example, maybe they were doing the basic step. Up here, it doesn't really look like I'm dancing, right? I'm just hanging out. So, you know, that's how we broke the rules, got away with it. Looks like you're not moving at all, right? <laughs> so, thank you. Yeah, great feet, right? So, <laughs> bunny step. Try your very best to slide and slide, slide and slide, slide and slide. All right, then we go back to the basic step. Who remembers how to do the basic step? Can you show me? One, two, three, scuff. One, two, three, scuff. One, two, three, scuff. One, two, three, scuff. Good job. All right. <laughs> so, then the next basic step, uh, sorry, I'm confused. The next fancy step I'm going to teach you is called the horse step. The horse step is really similar to the basic step, so you already almost learned it, except instead of the scuff, you're going to do a pause. So it's Ready? one, two, three, stop. 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 One, two, three, one, two, three. 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 Now, there's a couple of stylistic things you can do to this step. You can, on the third step, bend that knee so you kind of get lower. So it's one, two, three. One, two, three. Two, three. One, two, three. Um, if you're feeling really fancy and you're like, lyric, that is too easy for me. I'm a professional. Relax, okay? I get it. You're a professional. It's fine. I'll teach you the harder step. So you're going to twist. So you twist towards the foot that's going to be raising. So if you're stepping first with your right foot, you're twisting to the left. I see some twisting happening here. So the foot that you're lifting is going to be to the back. and jigging sound like a running horse. So did you hear the galloping horse when we did the horse step? That's what you're trying to go for in all your steps. Pretty easy, right? Okay, so then you would go back to the basic step. One, two, three, scuff. One, two, three, scuff. One, two, three, scuff. One, two, three, scuff. There's your step. Oh, last step? Yeah, we're gonna do. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Huh? Okay, yeah. So we're gonna do um, a nice, ba a basic old step, and it's kind of to the rhythm of the horse step, but it's also that it's that uh, old step where you're showing off your moccasins to everyone. You're showing off the bead work, or you're showing off your Crocs and your giblets. G lyrics. It's giblets and your Crocs. Giblets. Gibbets. Gibbets. You're showing off your gibbets. Or you're showing off your moccasins. Hey, huh? Giblets, yeah, that's a, that's a turkey, that's a. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna show off that front toe, but we're gonna try to do it like that horse step. So we're gonna go one, two, three. 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 You can kind of step on each one. So you're like on your toes and then on your flat foot. One, two, three, one, two, three, 
26, 26. And however you do it, whatever it feels like, like that, or up like this. One, two, three, one, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. So we can do that. Yeah. So that's that fancy set. We're showing off the fancy footwork, the fancy beads. Fill it up in the last one. No, you're good. You're good. So we're going to go. Oh, skipping. Okay, two. Okay, so we're going to do skipping, but you can do it in any version that you want to do. There's like four or five different skips. So the first one is the straight skip, where you step in front of you and then slide backwards. Step, slide. On the grass, you might have to do a little jump. Step, uh, step. And this is what it looks like on the side. It's kind of like the running net. Lots of kids will be teaching for like. So that's the first version. If you want to upgrade it, you can cross, skip, cross, skip, cross, cross, cross. And then the more complicated one is the forward skip, where we step backwards. Whoa. Step, step. Skip, skip, skip. So that one's, and then you can cross that one as well. Woo! Or you can do it diagonally. Then go cross, cross, step, sky. So you can do any one of those skip steps. All right, I think that's the course. All right, so we're going to do the dance. Now, let's talk about it first, so we're all on the same page here. What's the first thing you're going to do? The basic step, you're right. Okay, show me the basic step. One, two, three, scuff. One, two, three, scuff. All right, what's the first fancy step I taught you? Bunny. Whoop, whoop, whoop. All right, and then what are you gonna do? Basic step, one, two, three, scuff. One, two, three, scuff. All right, what's the next fancy step I taught you? Four step, you're right. One, two, three, one, two, three. One, two, three, one, two, three. One, two, three, one, two, three. All right, then what? Next, basic step, <laughs> three scuff, one, two, three scuff, one, two, three scuff. All right, and then what's the first step he taught you? The, the, the fancy close, right? We're gonna do tap, two, three, one, two, three. Tap, tap. Step, tap. tap. I don't know. So in Jiggy, there's lots of names for lots of steps, so sometimes we get confused, and then we have to fight about it. I'm saying this is step tap. He's saying this is forward course. So I'm probably right. So you should listen to me. One, two, three. Hey, did you know in square dancing, the woman stands on the right side because she's always right? So. Uh, All right. Okay. So I'm right. Step tap. <laughs> then after that is gonna be the basic step. One, two, three, step. One, two, three, step. And then we're gonna finish it off with whatever skipping step you wanna do. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you'd like to come join us on the stage, you can too, you know? We don't bite, promise. Anybody want to dance with us?